Greetings to everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the first seminar of 2023 organized by Climate Change and Law Laboratory of Kadir Has University Law Faculty. Our seminar series continue with a very special guest. Today, we host Professor Dr. Michael Gerard. Professor Gerard, welcome to our seminar. If Good you allow you. me, <laughs> I would like to introduce you to our audience before we start. Uh, Professor Michael Gerard is Andrew Sabin, Professor of Professional Practice at Columbia Law School, where he teaches courses on environmental and energy law. He is the founder and the faculty director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, which is one of the leading institutions in the world in, in the fight against the climate change through important researches and publications. He is also a member and former chair of the Faculty of Columbia's Earth Institute. He received his Bachelor of Art from Columbia University and his Juris Doctor from New York University School of Law. Before joining the Columbia faculty in January 2009, he was partner in charge of New York office of the Arnold Porter Law Firm, where he is now senior counsel to the firm. He practiced environmental law in New York City full-time from uh, 1979 to 2008. He was the 2004-2005 chair of the American Bar Association section of environment, energy, and resources. He has also chaired the executive committee of the New York City Bar Association and the environmental law section of the New York State Bar Association. Since 1986, he has written an environmental law column for the New York Law Journal. He is author or editor of 13 books, two of which were named Best Law Book of the Year by the Association of American Publishers, namely Environmental Law Practice Guide and Brownfield's Law and Practice. So I would like to thank you uh, for accepting our invitation, Professor Gerard. We are very, very honored to host you in our seminar series. And here I would like to leave the floor to you. Thank you so much. It is a great pleasure and honor to be with you virtually uh, today. I wish I could be uh, with you in person. So I'm going to be talking about uh, climate litigation uh, around the world. Um, let me start by um, uh, sharing my screen. Can you see that all right? Um, so our uh, so our center at Columbia Law School, uh, the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, maintains a uh, an online database in which we attempt to have all of the climate litigation in the world. Uh, we have uh, separated it between a, a database on U.S. climate litigation and one on uh, climate litigation in uh, in all other countries. Um, uh, to help us find the litigation all around the world, we have assembled uh, more than seven rapporteurs who are uh, experts in the laws and litigation in their own country uh, to help us make sure that we are identifying whatever cases are out there. And uh, we had some familiar faces uh, uh, among our uh, uh, rapporteurs, so we're we're very pleased to have two people from from Turkey who help us uh, make sure that we are aware of all the cases. Uh, so we have found in all uh, uh, 1,994 cases all around the world. This is as of April. There are, there are more since then. The United States has by far the most. 72% of all of the uh, climate cases in the world are from the United States. Australia is a distant second. Uh, the UK is a distant third. Uh, but in all, there are um, uh, cases in around 50 countries and in several international tribunals. The number of cases has been rising. Uh, what this chart shows is the number of cases per year 
uh, in in red are the cases from the United States. In blue are the cases in all other countries. And, and the 2002 is just a very partial um, up, up till the end of May. So we see that that climate litigation really took off around 2007. Uh, there, there were a few cases before then, uh, but they really it really took off in 2007 and it uh, continues to rise. Um, now, not all of this litigation is brought by those who are advancing climate action. Uh, some of the lawsuits are brought by uh, companies and others that want to delay climate action, um, uh, especially in, in the United States. But, but the overall volume is increasing. In the United States, which, as I said, has by far the largest number of climate cases, um, the the of these, the largest number are under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which is our federal law that requires environmental impact assessments for major federal actions that could have a significant effect on the environment. The, the states are also able to adopt their own similar laws if they want. Uh, California is the leader in doing that. And so we also have a large number of cases, what we call little NEPA cases, uh, under the state level environmental impact assessment laws. Uh, we have many uh, lawsuits under the Federal Clean Air Act, which is the principal U.S. Uh, uh, law addressing climate change. Um, uh, many cases under the Endangered Species Act and other laws designed to protect uh, uh, wildlife. Um, uh, a small number of cases asserting constitutional claims or common law claims or public trust claims, um, but these receive a great deal of prominence. Uh, these tend to be the most famous cases. So what I'm going to do uh, uh, first is talk about the uh, cases in the rest of the world, uh, and then I'll turn back to the cases in the United States. The Sabin Center works closely with the Grantham, Inst the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the London School of Economics, and um, uh, they rely heavily on the climate change law database that uh, the, the, the the database of litigation that we have put together, and they have put together a, a database called Climate Change Laws of the World, which has statutes and regulations from uh, almost every country in the world. Um, but so this is a report that was issued uh, a few months ago by Grantham, and the next several slides that I'm going to show you are taken from that report, although again, uh, much of it is, is based on our, our database. So the scholars at Grantham have um, identified a number of, the, um, uh, of these cases as government framework cases, meaning that these are lawsuits against the national governments um, uh, saying that uh, whatever laws they have in place uh, to deal with climate change are not adequate, either because they are not ambitious enough, they're not calling for enough reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, or they are not being implemented, even though they may be on the books. And so what this chart shows uh, is a... Um, uh, an increase in the number of these cases and then a real boom in them in 2021. Uh, the, the 2022 figures, again, are, are partial. Uh, they only are, are half a year. Uh, but we've seen quite a growth in these government framework cases around the world. Um, another category of cases are cases against what they call the carbon majors. They uh, very large um, companies that produce oil and gas and coal. And there are um, uh, uh, quite a few of these cases, as you can see. And here, again, in, in, in blue are the U.S. cases, and in red are the cases 
um, from other countries. So the cases against these energy companies are, are the, uh, there are more of them than any others, uh, but there are also lawsuits that are being brought against companies in other sectors of the economy. Uh, uh, this shows uh, just for the one year period of 31 May 2021 to 31 May 2022, uh, that all these sectors are being targeted uh, in one or more lawsuits uh, relating to their activities on climate change. Overall, counting the non-U.S. Uh, cases uh, since the beginning of the uh, 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 of this kind of litigation, uh, under the Grantham numbers, 54% of them were favorable, uh, favorable to greater action on climate change. 35% were unfavorable, and the rest were either neutral or were withdrawn or settled. So, so this is uh, since the beginning of, uh, of whenever this litigation started. On an annual basis, um, uh, we see, a, 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 again, in, in green are the, uh, the, the favorable outcomes and red are the unfavorable outcomes. Uh, so there are you know, quite a few in, in both categories. Um, the the most famous case, and 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 I, or, or what I think is probably the, the the most important of these cases, uh, was Urgenda versus Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, brought by uh, a large number of citizens of the Netherlands against the national government. Uh, the lawsuit uh, said that the pledges that um, Netherlands had made as part of the Paris Climate Agreement were too weak. As you know, the, the, the essence of the Paris Climate Agreement is that each country puts forward its own um, voluntary plan for how it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These plans are not enforceable uh, by the, uh, under the Paris Agreement. Um, and the design is for them to be strengthened every few years because all of these voluntary pledges do not add up to nearly enough reductions in greenhouse gas emissions to meet our climate goals. So the Netherlands had signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement. They had um, made a pledge and the lawsuit uh, said that the uh, pledge was too weak. It, it, it was not ambitious enough. Um, the trial, the, the case was brought in, in a trial level court in The Hague. The trial level court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. The case was appealed to the intermediate appellate court in the Netherlands. That court affirmed the trial court decision, and it went up to the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, which also ruled for the plaintiffs. So the principal um, a remedy. Uh, was an order that the government uh, reduce uh, the nation's greenhouse gas emissions by a particular percentage, and that was a higher percentage than the pledge that the Dutch government had made to Paris. The principal legal basis for the decision was the European Convention on Human Rights. The Netherlands was a signatory to that convention. Uh, the court said that, therefore, as a matter of Dutch law, the government was obligated to uh, to follow the requirements of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, and those included the right to life and the right to family life. The Supreme Court of the Netherlands held that climate change could impair the right to life and the right to family life, and that the uh, government needed to do more to um, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The, the court rejected the argument that since the emissions from the Netherlands are uh, only a small fraction of those in the world, uh, and therefore um, it wouldn't matter much what the Netherlands did, what mattered most was 
the emissions from China and the United States and India and other big countries. The court rejected that idea. The court said that every country has a, an obligation to do its part. And so they ordered uh, the, uh, the Dutch government to do its part. Um, this le did lead to uh, reducing the operations of several coal-fired power plants in the Netherlands. Although there is some question about whether the uh, judgment of the Supreme Court is being fully implemented, uh, so so the uh, uh, the trial court decision came out in 2016, the Supreme Court decision in 2019, and and the, the success in this case helped inspire many other lawsuits around the world. Another very important case was in Germany. Um, and the uh, a case in, in Germany, again, said that the promises that the German government had made as part of the Paris Climate Agreement were too weak. Uh, the um, a court in uh, Germany uh, agreed with the plaintiffs. It said that as a matter of requirements of the German constitution, the national government needed to take more uh, more steps uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the country, although it did not impose the same kind of precise numerical requirements that the Dutch court had imposed. Uh, we've also seen uh, uh, in uh, mostly in the last year or two um, uh, favorable decisions favorable toward uh, the fight against climate change in Brazil, Colombia, the Czech Republic, France, Mexico, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, and South Africa. Uh, most of these uh, lawsuits are based either on international human rights principles or on the constitutions of, of these countries. So the different kinds of, of cases can be broken into different categories. Uh, the first, the government framework cases, the case saying that the national laws uh, and actions on climate change are too weak. And I just spoke about the agenda case and the Neubauer case. There's a case pending in Pakistan that is making uh, similar arguments that is still pending. Uh, corporate framework uh, would be lawsuits that say that a particular corporation's are not doing enough. And the most prominent of these is also in the Netherlands, a case called Mayo Defense versus Royal Dutch Shell. Um, that is a uh, lawsuit saying that uh, Royal Dutch Shell is contributing uh, through its fossil fuel production, um, uh, excess uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the trial court in The Hague the same trial court that was involved in the Urgenda case uh, ruled for the plaintiffs, who are a, a non-governmental organization and, and, and campaigners and various individual members. Uh, they, they ruled that the emissions caused by the use of the oil and gas produced by Royal Dutch Shell are contributing to climate change. And they required... Uh, Shell to reduce those emissions 45% by the year 2030. Um, what is extraordinary about that decision is, is in the first place, it applies not only to Shell's operations in the Netherlands, but also to Shell's operations all over the world. And secondly, and even more importantly, it applies not only to the direct emissions from Shell, you know, the, the, such as the methane that leaks out during the production process, but also to the emissions from the use of its product, the emissions of its customers, the, the, the emissions from all of us who might drive automobiles that use petrol from Shell. Um, so, so that is quite an unusual uh, decision. It's in fact the only decision uh, 
in the world, so far as we know, that holds fossil fuel companies accountable for the greenhouse gas emissions from the use of their product. Uh, so that was a decision from the trial level court. Unsurprisingly, Royal Dutch Shell has filed an appeal. That appeal is now pending in the intermediate appellate court in the Netherlands. And I expect that whatever decision comes out from uh, that court uh, may well be appealed to the Supreme Court of the Netherlands. So we don't yet know the outcome. Um, we probably won't know the final outcome for another year or two or longer. Uh, but this is certainly a, a remarkable decision that has gotten a lot of attention in the corporate community because it's difficult to see how Shell is going to meet the requirements of the order without a fundamental change to its business model. Because, of course, it's in the business of producing and selling oil and gas. So we'll see what happens. Uh, there are a few cases that uh, say that uh, countries that have imposed requirements are not uh, enforcing those requirements. Uh, uh, most of these cases are in the United States. Uh, on, on public finance, there is a lawsuit pending in South Africa um, uh, saying that um, the um, the national government should not be helping with the financing of certain proposed um, coal mines and other fossil fuel extraction facility. We also see some litigation about failure to adopt, failure to prepare for the coming impacts of climate change. Uh, this lawsuit in Australia, which is now pending, concerns the management of water resources in uh, in South Africa. Um, there are many lawsuits in the United States um, uh, seeking uh, to require fossil fuel companies to pay money damages uh, caused by um, uh, climate change. I'll talk more about that a little later. Uh, but the most prominent case outside of the United States uh, seeking that relief is Lua versus RWE. Mr. Lua is a farmer in Peru. He says that his farm is being harmed by the melting of the glaciers in the Andes Mountains and that fossil fuel emissions leading to global warming are why the glaciers are melting. Uh, RWE is the largest electric utility company in Germany. And so this lawsuit was brought in the courts of Germany against RWE. Uh, the plaintiffs say that the emissions from RWE are responsible for about 5%, I'm sorry, 0.5% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so the plaintiff is demanding that RWE pay 0.5% of the damages he has suffered as a result of the melting of the, of the glaciers in the Andes Mountains. This lawsuit, uh, again, brought in a trial level court in Germany, survived the initial motions. Uh, the judges of the court decided they wanted to actually go to Peru and personally observe the glaciers, which is a very unusual request. Uh, and they were planning to do it, but then the pandemic hit and travel was suspended. Uh, but about two months ago, uh, the judges actually went to Peru uh, to observe the glaciers. And uh, uh, we now await their decision. There are quite a few uh, uh, lawsuits brought under what's called here climate washing or sometimes called greenwashing, uh, uh, the, the allegation that companies are falsely claiming to be more environmentally sound than they really are. So this is a, a, a lawsuit uh, against Santos, which is a large oil company in Australia. 
claiming that Santos has made false claims about uh, its environmental soundness. Um, there are um, a few cases that have been brought uh, against the individual members of the boards of directors of corporations. So Client Earth, which is uh, an NGO in uh, London, uh, based in London, that has offices in other cities, has brought a, a lawsuit against the individual members of the board of, of Shell. Uh, this lawsuit is still in its very early stages. Um, there have not been any successful lawsuits uh, against individual directors or officers or executives of companies relating to climate change. Uh, but this is certainly an effort to impose that kind of liability. There are also a number of lawsuits that have been brought, or uh, some of them decided, some of them are pending, in international tribunals. Uh, so several residents of the Torres Strait, which is a number of small islands near Australia, and um, part of the territory of Australia, uh, uh, brought a claim to the United Nations Human Rights Commission, claiming that Australia had failed to um, protect the residents of these islands from the physical impacts of climate change, such as sea level rise. Um, the Human Rights Commission uh, ruled that uh, ruled for the claimants. They, they ruled that it is correct. Uh, that the government of Australia failed to carry out its duty to protect this indigenous population in these islands. Uh, the UN, UN Human Rights Commission does not have the power to actually enforce its orders. They can't force the government of Australia to do more, but certainly the fact that they have issued this decision is a very powerful statement. There are several cases pending in the European Court of Human Rights. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, there have been two cases decided by the Court of Justice of the European Union. I'll say more about that in a minute. A petition has just been filed a few days ago with the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Uh, the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea says that member countries um, must not act or permit actions that could degrade the oceans in particular ways. And so the claim here is that greenhouse gas emissions are degrading the oceans, and that's a violation of the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. Again, this is this petition was, this, uh, was just filed, so it's very early. Um, about 10 years ago, um, our center at Columbia joined with the Republic of the Marshall Islands in holding a, a big conference here at Columbia on the issue of legal issues faced by threatened island nations, the island nations that are threatened by sea level rise. Uh, partly growing out of that conference, the Marshall Islands and Palau, another one of the very small Pacific island nations, attempted to go before the International Court of Justice in The Hague with a question concerning the obligation of the major emitting countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. In order to get before the International Court of Justice uh, for an advisory opinion, which is what was sought here, it was necessary uh, to have a majority vote of the membership of the United Nations General Assembly. At the time of this effort, in 2012, uh, the United States government actively opposed um, that effort. Uh, Barack Obama was the president at the time. Um, and um, it was not possible to get anywhere near the votes necessary in the United Nations General Assembly. More recently, Vanuatu, which is another one of the endangered Pacific island nations, has revived that idea of trying to go before the International Court of Justice. Uh, the political situation has changed, and now the proponents of this 
res of this uh, resolution uh, are um, optimistic that they uh, have the number of votes they need. Uh, it, it may be that the United Nations General Assembly will vote as early as, as March. If they do that, and if they do refer the case to the International Court of Justice, every member state in the United Nations will be invited to make its own submission to the court. Um, and and so this uh, so this whole process will probably take several years, uh, but a decision by an advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice uh, could have uh, a significant effect globally, even though that court also does not have the authority to enforce its advisory opinions. But as we're seeing, there are all these other lawsuits arising in the domestic courts of countries and courts that do have the power to issue binding decisions on their governments on, and on their on corporations within those countries. Um, and so a favorable decision from the International Court of Justice could strengthen many of these domestic lawsuits. I mentioned that there were several cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights. There are eight cases that are now pending. Uh, in March, you know, in about two months, uh, the European Court of Human Rights will be hearing, uh, will be holding hearings on at least two of these cases. Um, uh, these are typically cases brought by uh, citizens of a country against that country, saying that it is doing too little to, to fight climate change. Uh, there have been uh, a few cases before the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, but those have not been successful. So that's my summary of the litigation um, across the world, other than the United States. Uh, I'm now going to talk about the litigation within the United States, since, as I showed, 72% of all the climate litigation in the world is happening in the U.S. So the most famous recent decision in the U.S. was a decision by the United States Supreme Court in a case called West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. But let me give uh, a little bit of uh, background on um, on that case. Um, so back in uh, 2007, uh, the uh, uh, US uh, EPA under President George W. Bush was saying that it did not have the power to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a lawsuit had been brought saying that the Clean Air Act, which was published, which was first enacted in 1970, uh, gave EPA the power to regulate uh, whatever air pollutants EPA felt were causing an, an endangerment. Uh, EPA, under President Bush, refused to do that, uh, saying that this was not an appropriate use of the Clean Air Act. The Supreme Court um, disagreed with President Bush. It said that uh, the uh, Clean Air Act does authorize EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions if EPA issues a formal finding that uh, uh, these greenhouse gas emissions are causing uh, an endangerment. It was a five to four decision. So it, the decision was, was narrow, but it, it did say that EPA had that power. Um, uh, President uh, Bush did not do much uh, with that power while he was uh, still in office, but a year and a half after the decision, President Obama took office, and President Obama uh, directed EPA to uh, start uh, acting on greenhouse gas emissions. So EPA issued this formal endangerment finding, which was the necessary next step in, in December 2009. It was uh, met with more than 100 lawsuits uh, brought primarily by industries and by various states that are opposed to climate regulation. Um, the uh, um, US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit 
heard all of these cases and it ruled entirely for uh, EPA. It said that EPA was acting well within its powers and that it had an ample administrative record um, to uh, support its um, uh, its decision. Um, uh, EPA had also issued a rule strengthening the regulation of emissions from uh, automobiles, and that was also upheld. Uh, but at the time, the largest kind of source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States was coal-fired power plants. And um, in October of 2015, EPA, again under President Obama, issued a regulation called the Clean Power Plan, which was designed to move the uh, power sector in the United States um, away from coal uh, toward cleaner sources of electricity. Uh, the same day that they um, issued the final regulation, they were sued in court by several uh, states. Uh, the the case went up to by 26 states, more than half the states. Um, the uh, uh, case uh, went up to the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Um, the Court of Appeals denied the a challenger's request for an immediate uh, stay in the, you know, halt to the implementation of the plan. They denied that and sent oral argument. But to almost everyone's surprise, the U.S. Supreme Court then stepped in and stayed the plan by a vote of five to four. They said that EPA had to halt implementation of the plan. Uh, Donald Trump had run for uh, the presidency, uh, promising to revoke the clean power plan. When he took office, EPA did that. EPA revoked the clean power plan and replaced it with a much weaker rule called the Affordable Clean Energy Rule. Um, the Court of Appeals vacated that rule, but EPA, a weaker rule, but EPA said it was not going to go back to the clean power plan, that it was going to um, come up with a new plan. The U.S. Supreme Court again stepped in, to most people's surprise, um, decided to take the case, and they issued a ruling in June called West Virginia versus EPA. Uh, the decision by the court um, said basically that the Clean Power Plan had gone beyond the powers of the EPA under the Clean Air Act. Uh, the Supreme Court said that even though there was language in the Clean Air Act that arguably authorized EPA to act on climate change, uh, EPA uh, had really gone too far because they were um, uh, seeking to regulate a major portion of the economy. And uh, the Supreme Court said that uh, they needed much more explicit authority from Congress to take such a major action. Um, and Congress had not specifically talked about climate change. Uh, in fact, um, until the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed this summer, uh, the United States Congress had not passed any major new environmental laws since 1990. Uh, more than 30 years have passed since Congress has passed a major new environmental law because there's such an intense partisan divide between the Democrats and the Republicans in Congress that they haven't been able to agree on much of anything. But the Supreme Court said um, that um, explicit congressional authorization was needed uh, for the Clean Power Plan. Since that had not been granted, um, it said that the Clean Power Plan could not be uh, brought back so the Supreme Court announced a new doctrine called the major questions doctrine, the idea that uh, if an agency is going to address a major question, it needs very explicit congressional authorization. Uh, this decision is being um, uh, used by many um, uh, litigants uh, to challenge other actions uh, uh, by, the, um, uh, by the government, uh, but there are... Um, many actions that do not seem to be affected. The, the court did not reverse the Massachusetts versus EPA uh, decision, though many people had thought it might. 
And there are many other authorities that EPA has to regulate greenhouse gases that do not seem to be, or, or other actions by sources of uh, emissions that don't seem to be uh, uh, effective, but we'll see. There will be, this litigation will continue intensely for the next several years. Another line of litigation um, um, uh, began, or the most important uh, decision so far was called American Electric Power versus Connecticut. The state of Connecticut and several other states sued several electric power companies, asking the court to order them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, to issue an injunction. Um, that court, uh, that, that case was ultimately dismissed by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that um, EPA was the only entity that could decide the appropriate levels of greenhouse gas emissions, that the Clean Air Act gave that power to EPA. The court in the Massachusetts case that I just talked about had said that this applies to greenhouse gases and so the court said that the federal common law of nuisance, which was the theory being used, was not available uh, to require these companies to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, this case was uh, pending. There was another lawsuit uh, brought by the, pop the indigenous population of a village in Alaska, uh, saying that, um, uh, you know, they lived on a peninsula, uh, that was protected by sea ice, but the melting of the ice was endangering the village. Uh, the plaintiff said that the um, uh, fossil fuel companies were responsible for this, and they sued them not for an injunction, but for money damages, for the cost it would take to relocate the village, to move the village to a safer place. Um, the court held that uh, this case was governed by the um, American Electric Power case that I just talked about, and this case was dismissed as well. But these decisions were based exclusively on the federal common law of nuisance, which is a, a legal doctrine uh, to apply when there are gaps in, in, in federal law. Um, and the courts had held there's no gap. We have the Clean Air Act and EPA's power. But the courts um, did not decide, and they left open the question of whether the state common law of nuisance could apply, whether state law uh, could, uh, uh, could apply to these cases. The court said federal law could not, but they didn't rule on state law. So beginning in 2017, uh, we saw uh, the first of about 25 cases uh, that have been brought under state common law nuisance uh, um, against, these are almost all brought by cities or counties or states against oil and gas and coal companies. Uh, they are all seeking money damages uh, from these oil and gas and coal companies uh, so that these uh, plaintiffs can prepare for climate change, can build sea walls and take other actions. Um, these question, these cases were almost all brought in state court. There's, um, and, but the fossil fuel companies were saying they belong in federal court. These are really federal actions. They should be decided in federal court. So um, uh, almost six years after the first of these cases, this, this question still has not been decided. There's been a lot of litigation uh, back and forth. Um, I won't get into the details of it, uh, but the Supreme Court um, is being asked to finally decide whether these cases belong in state court or federal court. The um, the plaintiffs all want these cases to be in state court because they think they'll do better in state court. The defendant fossil fuel companies all want these to be in federal court. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, the um, uh, skip this. Uh, another a theory that's being brought in some of these cases is the idea of of false advertising. Uh, the the claim that these um, uh, fossil fuel companies have put out misleading information ab about the effects of climate change, and you know, particularly several years ago, there were a lot of advertisements um, uh, by uh, uh, some of these companies saying that climate change isn't really happening. 
or it's exaggerated. Um, and so th these lawsuits are are making claims um, um, about that. Um, and uh, uh, th these are these are pending. Uh, there uh, was one lawsuit brought by the state of New York against um, um, Exxon Mobil, saying that it had made uh, misleading statements in its securities filings. That case went to trial. Uh, Exxon won. Uh, the court found that the state had not made out its case. Uh, but there are several other cases that are now pending, brought by shareholders against ExxonMobil, and but those are st uh, making similar claims, but those are still pending. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission is um, now considering a regulation that would require much greater disclosure uh, of climate impacts by uh, by publicly traded companies. Um, the final rule is expected to come out in two or three months. It will be certainly challenged in um, a nar large number of lawsuits, and we'll see what happens uh, with that. Um, the final kind of cases um, in the U.S. that I'm going to talk about uh, are under the public trust doctrine, the idea that uh, going back many years, that the government has an obligation to um, um, protect aspect, certain aspects of the natural environment, such as forests or rivers and streams. Um, Joseph Sachs was a prominent law professor in the United States who, in 1970, wrote a famous article about the public trust doctrine, sort of reviving the uh, the doctrine that had dated back to Roman law. And Professor Mary Wood of the University of Oregon uh, then began writing that this public trust doctrine also applies to the atmosphere, that governments have an obligation to uh, reduce their, uh, to, to uh, protect the atmosphere from uh, emissions that could damage climate change. Using this theory, an organization formed in Oregon called Our Children's Trust, a non-governmental organization that began bringing lawsuits uh, based on this theory. And in all, they brought about 25 of them. I've got three pages of this. Uh, uh, they brought it all over the United States. Most of these cases were uh, dismissed by the courts, uh, which either found that the plaintiffs uh, did not have standing to bring the lawsuits, or these were not proper cases for the courts uh, to handle. Uh, but then uh, there was a case uh, in, Oregon, in Oregon called the Juliana case uh, that uh, became very prominent. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, so most of these cases were dismissed, but but there's one brought in the state of Montana, um, brought in the Montana state courts claiming that the constitution of the state of Montana requires uh, the state to, to change its energy policy so that it's uh, uh, less friendly to fossil fuels. That case is going to trial. Uh, the, the latest, uh, uh, this is February, but that's been pushed back. So in June or July, this case will go to trial. That'll be very interesting to watch. As I said, the Juliana case became very prominent. Uh, this is a, a press conference of the lawyers and the plaintiffs and others uh, uh, that they held. And this is what the plaintiffs were seeking. Order defendants, they're suing the federal government, order defendants to prepare and implement an enforceable national remedial plan to phase out fossil fuel emissions and draw down excessive atmospheric carbon dioxide. A very ambitious claim. Uh, the trial court uh, was very sympathetic to the plaintiffs and ordered a trial. The case went back and forth, uh, but ultimately the U.S. Court of Appeals um, uh, dismissed the lawsuit. Uh, they agreed with the plaintiffs that the um, uh, that climate change was a serious problem. Uh, they agreed that humans are the principal cause. They agreed that the federal government had a role in encouraging fossil fuels. Uh, they agreed with all of that, but they said it was beyond their power to act on it, that it was really up to Congress and the president to act. And the court 
um, uh, refused uh, to act. It dismissed uh, the case. There was a dissenting judge. Uh, it was a three-judge panel. The dissenter vigorously said, um, uh, no one else is acting. That This is a real threat to humanity and that the court should act. But they, uh, the, the court the majority dismissed the case. The plaintiffs are now trying again. Um, um, they they are asking the uh, the court for permission to amend their complaint to make a less ambitious uh, request for relief. They are at this point only asking for a declaration by the court about obligations and not a direct order. So the court heard argument on this more than a year ago. She still hasn't decided, and we'll see what happens. So, so the final thing that I want to say before I um, open it up for questions is there are a lot of uh, kinds of litigation that we see coming that, that will happen, uh, that we don't have many of the, these cases yet, but we'll see many of it, more of them. We know that large numbers of people are... Uh, going to be displaced by uh, climate change, as well as by other factors, and they're going to try to move to other countries. Uh, Turkey is certainly well aware of that phenomenon, uh, and we'll see, we expect to see more litigation about that. Uh, there will be more litigation about the disasters that occur are occurring as a result of climate change, and who is responsible for them. Flooding, wildfires, heat waves, all the other things that uh, climate change is causing. Um, implementing the uh, requirements uh, that are imposed by uh, regulations and statutes is going to be challenging. So for example, last year, the uh, Congress uh, for the first time took a major action on climate change in the US called the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, setting aside, uh, uh, allocating many hundreds of billions of dollars to um, transition to clean energy. There are going to be many challenges uh, to implementation of that, and that will inevitably lead to lawsuits. Um, there will be uh, litigation about who is responsible for all of this and who should pay. What are the fair shares uh, of, of different countries and, and different companies? Uh, there are many disputes between investors and states under investment bilateral or multilateral investment treaties. That will be litigated. There'll be cases about, um, you know, disputes about the what's called the just transition, moving from a fossil fuel based economy to a clean energy economy uh, and making sure that uh, workers and uh, communities are not harmed, what we call the um, just transition, transnational responsibility, the, the responsibility of some countries to others. We'll see more claims by indigenous groups and the, the whole issue of loss and damage. Should the developed countries pay for the damages suffered by uh, the, the poor countries? Uh, that's another hot issue. Um, my last slide said, what does all this litigation accomplish? Um, uh, it can have a direct impact in changing uh, uh, regulations um, and government actions, but th these cases also can have indirect impacts. Uh, they tend to receive a lot of publicity, a lot of notice in the press, so they raise public awareness, they mobilize public sentiment, they keep climate change on the political agenda, um, and um, uh, may allow some non-litigation strategies, and they may affect corporate behavior. So uh, the success of these lawsuits is measured not only by whether the courts issue favorable decisions, uh, but also what are the other things that happen outside the courtroom influenced by these cases. So that's my presentation, and I would be happy to address uh, any questions that any of you have. Many thanks, Professor Jared, for your insightful presentation and also uh, for uh, notifying us about the remarkable cases. And I would be happy to moderate the question and answer session. Uh, so I invite uh, participants to raise hands if they want to uh, 
pose their questions. Also, I have some questions in the chat box, so I want to start reading them first. Uh, first question is from uh, Maria Ivanova. Uh, the question follows, as you mentioned, several cases brought by citizens against their government. The ability of a citizen to sue a powerful energy company or their own government in light of their disproportional sources and knowledge comes to mind. What procedural, uh, sorry, what procedural rules are in place in USA that could balance this inequality between the parties? So the Clean Air Act and most of the other federal environmental statutes have what are called citizen suit provisions, which say that citizens may uh, sue uh, the government or may sue companies for violations of those statutes. Uh, the Supreme Court has held that in order to bring um, uh, these lawsuits, the citizens must establish standing. And in particular, they, 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 they must show that they are personally affected by the action they're complaining about, that they're affected differently than the public at large, and that the courts uh, can provide some kind of relief. Um, so there have been quite a few successful lawsuits against particular projects, against you know coal-fired power plants or coal mines or that kind of thing, when they're brought by, especially by the neighbors, who can say that their own personal environment will be hurt uh, by the action that is being challenged. Uh, so that that is fairly well established. It's it's more difficult to bring a challenge against a global problem like uh, climate change. The Massachusetts case said that states may bring these these actions that, that they states have special ability to bring these lawsuits because they can show their their harm and they have special sovereignty. Um, um, but uh, we've we've had uh, quite a few cases in the U.S. that have been able to overcome these hurdles and have been able to uh, to move forward. And that's one of the reasons why we have so much so many lawsuits in the US uh, that that many of these uh, uh, lawsuits are successful. Thank you for the answer, Professor Jerry. And, and thanks uh, to Ms. Ivanova for the question. The second question comes from uh, Taren Okpoko. I hope I pronounced it right. The question is, with the recent decisions of the UK Court of Appeal in the Friends of the Earth versus Foreign Export Finance on the funding of Mozambique's LNG, is the Paris Climate Agreement ever going to achieve its goals of cutting uh, GHG emissions? And uh, also a second question, uh, with Scott's decision in West Virginia versus EPA, would uh, the SEC's climate risks disclosure rules ever come into force without legislative consent? Uh, so first on the question about Paris, we know that the Paris, uh, the, the pledges that the countries of the world have made uh, as part of the Paris Climate Agreement are uh, too weak. They do not add up to nearly enough emissions reductions that are necessary in order to meet the Paris temperature targets. And we also know that most countries are not even fulfilling their pledges, that most countries are not reducing emissions to the extent that they have promised. So the the short answer to your question of will the Paris uh, or Paris agreement succeed in uh, meeting its objectives, I think the short answer is I'm not optimistic about that. I think is I think it's falling short. It's certainly making progress, you know, more 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 is being done as a result of the Paris the, uh, Agreement than was done without it, but it is not, um, it's not nearly enough. Um, on your question about the Securities and Exchange Commission rule, um, we know that there will be lawsuits uh, challenging that rule based on the West Virginia versus EPA case. Um, and it's difficult to predict exactly how those were tur will turn out. The Securities and Exchange Commission rule is not requiring companies to reduce their emissions. It's merely requiring greater disclosure. Um, the, the, the commission has, you know, for, for many years, uh, you know, since it was formed in the 1930s, been requiring corporate disclosures on 
many, many things. So this is another thing that would be disclosed. Um, and it's, it's something that many uh, investors have said uh, is, uh, is material to their decisions on investment. But there are arguments on both sides of that, and and uh, I don't want to predict what will happen. Uh, I will say, however, that if the uh, final Securities and Exchange Commission rule is ultimately um, uh, invalidated by the courts, that several of the states are likely to adopt their own laws, in particular New York and California, may adopt uh, requirements for disclosure by companies that operate in those states, which is most big companies. Uh, so even if the Securities and Exchange Commission rule is um, invalidated by the courts, that's not the end of the story. And and there are, of course, many other disclosure requirements coming out of Europe and and and, and many other places that uh, that also uh, will require similar kinds of disclosures. And thanks again for your answer, Professor Jared, and um, thanks for the question. Uh, and are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, they can write it down via chat or uh, they can raise hands. And uh, there's a question from uh, Aykut Burda. Please, Mr. Burda. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you, Professor Jared, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask about uh, dispute resolution in environmental law and uh, cases regarding uh, environmental rights. Like, uh, is there a chance uh, for environmental arbitration or other dispute resolutions to be a thing in this area, or do you see it as uh, something as optimistic? Thank you. Um, I don't see arbitration being used in these environmental rights cases because, of course, arbitration requires some kind of agreement between the parties uh, to uh, uh, submit to arbitration. And no countries have uh, uh, or companies have agreed to submit to arbitration in human rights theories about, about climate change. Um, if there are binding legal judgments um, uh, concerning financial liability, uh, I could imagine agreements then being reached on how to assess the amount of financial liability um, um, without going to trial. I could imagine that kind of thing. Um, we're nowhere near that, but but so far on, on these, on these uh, human rights and related theories, um, I'm afraid that I don't see a pathway to uh, to arbitration. We're not even seeing mediation uh, again because the laws, uh, the 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 obligations have not been clearly established, and so the companies that would, or countries that uh, could be subjected to this, are not going to agree even to mediation until it's clear that there really is some obligation that they have in the first place. Thank you for your answer. Many thanks. And we have another question from Yos uh, Eranabonos. And thanks for the organization and the presentation. Uh, I have two questions. One, if I didn't get it wrong, you said database also includes lawsuits against climate action. So does the database include strategic lawsuits against public participation? If it does, could you elaborate on those kind of lawsuits? And second, RWE sued Netherlands because of its climate targets depending on the Energy Charter Treaty. As far as I know, it didn't settle yet. What is your opinion on the possible outcome of this specific example? Well, in, in, in the first place, uh, yeah, many of the lawsuits, especially in the United States, are brought by companies um, uh, and by those states that do not favor climate uh, regulation, such as West Virginia and Texas, um, challenging the government action. Uh, um, these, uh, these lawsuits tend to be brought when there is a, uh, a, a Democrat in, in the White House, or the, whether it's Barack Obama or Joe Biden acting on climate change. Uh, when there was a Republican in the White House, whether it's George Bush or Donald Trump, they, lawsuits tend to come from the other side. Uh, but there are large numbers of these um, uh, of these lawsuits. Uh, it's, as a general matter, anything that 
the government does on climate change, whether pro or con will be challenged in court by somebody. Um, but the, the, there continue to be very active um, um, uh, abilities for public participation. Um, you know, the I mentioned the citizen suits uh, uh, provisions in this very in these various statutes. Uh, most of the administrative decisions uh, by government agencies uh, require uh, public hearings and other forms of public participation. So that continues to be uh, very vigorous. On the question of the outcome of the RWE case, um, I don't want to predict that, but the fact that the judges were so interested in the case that they actually flew to Peru to observe the glaciers suggests they are taking it very seriously. Um, and they wouldn't do that if they were just going to dismiss the lawsuit out of hand. Um, but uh, it, it'll be very interesting to see what, what the trial level court does. And then I'm sure that whatever it does will be appealed to, to higher courts. So the final uh, decision here is still quite some uh, years away, I think. Thanks for the question and uh, the answer. So there are two following questions. Uh, first one is from Akin Tuzdular. Uh, what does Professor Jared think about the upcoming EU carbon tax, and can we utilize uh, tax law to fight the climate crisis? Well, certainly, uh, almost all the economists think that that's a good idea. Um, not as many of the politicians do. Um, uh, the I think the the EU carbon tax in theory could accomplish a good deal. I think it's partly a response to the active proposals in the United States for carbon border tax adjustments. So I think there's a real possibility of a border war where each, um, uh, where, where Europe tries to impose uh, taxes on other countries, the US tries to impose taxes on other countries. They don't impose so much, so much taxes on their own citizens and companies. Uh, I see this as a, um, a as a grounds for considerable potential future international um, uh, disputes. I, I don't think any of them are so serious that they'll become military disputes, but I but I think we will see uh, quite a bit of fighting. We'll probably see some cases brought before the WTO, um, and uh, uh, this this will be a very active. Uh, a uh, source of, of dispute. Thank you, Professor Jared. And uh, the other question is from uh, Maria Ivanova again. And she says, you cited implementation as a problem in environmental law. Do you envision a remedy like a supranational organization or a type of violation registry that could curb environmental law violations by governments and multinational organizations? Well, if the question is, do I see some international body that would do that? Uh, no, uh, because I don't think that any countries would consent to having some international body adjudicate what, what's happening with their domestic companies. Uh, I just don't think that's politically realistic. I understand the, the desirability of such a mechanism, uh, but I don't think that, that uh, the United States or China or other major emitting countries would would agree to have uh, some international body make those decisions. At the uh, domestic level, um, there are uh, many agencies that are involved in the implementation of of these uh, of these decisions. Is ultimately up to the head of government, the president, or the prime minister to try to make sure that these. Uh, uh, that implementation happens at the national level, but they have many other priorities. And that's one reason why uh, the courts are so important in those countries where um, those kinds of procedures are allowable and also um, uh, oversight by uh, Congress or, or, or Parliament is also very important. But um, I don't see a pathway for a, a, a single, even at the national level, a single entity sitting on top and making binding decisions on, on implementation. I, I, I wish I could say that I would expect that, but unfortunately I don't. Thank you so much. Uh, 
And uh, if there are no other questions uh, with this opportunity, if you let me, I want to ask uh, a question uh, to you. And um, you mentioned many uh, case, uh, climate litigation cases, but as Paris Agreement is also a novelty for Turkey and Turkish law, uh, climate litigation is also very new to uh, very new in Turkey. We have reported with Dr. Artuch, uh, who is also the national reporter for Turkey, two cases, but they are not crystal clear climate litigation cases, but have some uh, climate arguments. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the that many type of climate litigation cases that you mentioned, uh, I think maybe Turkish lawyers feel a bit thrown in at the deep end uh, to determine uh, their outcome. And um, maybe for uh, with a very overview uh, perspective, uh, which type of climate litigation cases like corporate framework or governmental framework or in others have uh, a more efficient or um, more uh, meaningful um, outcome uh, in your perspective in terms of uh, the global climate goals or uh, in terms of the of firing the direct and indirect uh, outcomes that you mentioned. So if it is uh, concerning a particular project, a, a pipeline or a power plant or a mine or something like that, um, that litigation has, has often been successful if there are statutes and regulations that uh, can be argued to have been violated. Um, usually these are, these concern uh, violations relating to um, uh, not to greenhouse gases, but to conventional air pollution or to water pollution or some other aspects. Um, um, broader lawsuits um, like the Mayu Defense versus Royal Dutch Shell uh, are rare, you know, or the successes are rare. We, we, we have that one case. Um, uh, we, we don't have uh, many others that that really say that corporations as a whole need to take greater action as opposed to just action on particular projects. Um, in in terms of uh, of lawsuits against the, um, the 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 national governments, we're we're seeing an and an, uh, increasing number of. Um, uh, of, of successful lawsuits, um, you know, it largely depends on, you know, the international human rights agreements that a particular country has signed on to. Um, but uh, it's my understanding that Turkey has agreed to the European Convention on Human Rights, and, and there have been quite a few successful lawsuits under that theory. And so I would think that there may be some promise of for the, the use of that. I, I know less about the details of Turkish law than everyone else on this call, uh, but uh, but the fact that there has been uh, success in quite a few countries under that convention suggests that it certainly uh, would warrant a close look. Thank you so much, Professor Darren. And uh, are there any other questions from the audience? I see no other questions in my chat box, and I see no other raised hands. So. Uh, if you let me, uh, I would like to conclude this session. Many thanks, Professor Jared, accepting to be with us uh, and for your uh, insightful presentation. And uh, thanks uh, to the audience for being with us. And we hope to see you in our further uh, and upcoming events. So uh, I would like to give the floor once again to you, Professor Jared, for your uh, concluding words. So thank you very much. I enjoyed being with you, uh, and I look forward to our, our future communications, and good luck to everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you uh, to everyone, and have a nice evening. You too.